shut it off. It's certainly like fire department up there. Building, yeah, building will start to shut. Thank you very much. Sorry. That's all right. Hopefully everybody will be able to stay. Um, as was mentioned, I'm, I'm Dr. Brian Liss, and I know an awful lot of you here because we've been hanging out together for, oh, you know, maybe almost 20 years now, going back to the Nicaragua days. So thank you very much for having me back. Um, um, so I want to thank you for the glasses since that was brought up. Every year you guys give us about 1,500 pairs, and Jerry um, makes sure that I get them, and they go off to Malawi, and before that they were going to Nicaragua, and they're very, very grateful to get them. So um, a couple other things I want to mention. We have our Shameless Commerce Division over there. You can't have the tree sculpture because Dick already bought it, but if anybody's interested in buying some African cloth or those wooden plaques, uh, they're for sale as a way of raising money for what we do. Um, and I also want to mention that we have partnered with the Longwood Symphony Orchestra, so on the 4th of May, 2019, if you guys like classical music, there will be a classical music concert at Jordan Hall in Boston. Um, it's a fundraiser for us. Um, it's at 6 o'clock. And so you, if you watch our website, you'll see it get posted um, as we get closer. One of the things that they've asked us to do, and this is, you guys are the experts. I'm listening to how you've done this with the tree lighting festival, is go around and buttonhole people and try to get money out of them for ads and things like that. So if anybody you know, is interested in having an ad in their program, I realize it's Boston and this is Stowe. Feel free to get in touch with me. Um, so having said all that, I'm going to do something different from the prior years. So this year, instead of just giving you a bunch of slides of the trip, which is what I normally do, that's what those pictures were. I want to talk about how Bridges to Malawi has changed in the last year because we've gone from just a medical mission trip of the high school contest to a development agency. And I also want to introduce my niece, Naomi. Um, so she's gone two years in a row, and I think she's totally hooked now. Um, so she's part of our IT department. Okay, so this is Precious. Precious is getting a little older. He's not quite as cute as he used to be, but he's my favorite, my favorite person in Malawi. Next slide. Next slide. So this is where we started. So I like to tell people that <clears throat> I, I was trained as a primary care internist, but then I morphed into an emergency department doctor. So what do ER doctors do? They put out fires. What do primary care internists do? They prevent stuff from happening. So we started with the putting out fire stuff, which is the medical mission trip and bringing stuff to the hospital and doing medical stuff. And the high school contest you all know about, so we run this contest every year. Um, we've already run it this year. Um, we had um, a kid from, I want to say Marlboro win this year, but we had a lot of participation. We had like 23 kids show up the first night, which is so huge for us. And we'll probably be taking 13 high school kids with us, which is also a big group, because we just didn't want to disappoint them. Um, next slide. So in the hospital, we saw so many kids, and we continue to see this, who come in and die from malaria. Malaria is a big killer in sub-Saharan Africa, and it particularly kills pregnant women and little kids. And one of the reasons that it kills these people, particularly the little kids, is if your mom and dad, and you're running a farm with seven kids, and you're hours away from the hospital, there's no cell phone, there's no 911, there's no nothing like that, and there's no backup for you. So just getting a sick person to the hospital is a major production and not easy to do because you might have to walk three hours with your sick kid puking all over the place while you're doing that. But the other part of it is hospitals in the developing world, and Malawi is an example of that, provide medical care. So you might think of medical care as being everything you get in a hospital in America. Medical care. No food, no laundry services, no nothing else but medical care. So if you want to get fed when you're in the hospital, your family member has to come and stay and cook the food for you. So that means usually mom. So if mom's going to drop what she's doing, dad's going to stay and try to work the farm and take care of the other kids, that's a huge problem. So they wait and wait and wait, hoping the kid will get better. And when it's obvious that the kid's not going to get better, that's when they come to the hospital. And by that time, it's very often too late. So the mortality rate for malaria um, is somewhere between, depending on whose statistics you read, one out of three and two out of three in little kids in Africa. Um, so because it was so awful to watch this, we decided we would get into the prevention business. So this was the first prevention thing. So we started IRS. So that's the good IRS. It stands for Indoor Residual Spraying. And I want you to know we're out of that business now. The reason is the mosquitoes didn't figure out how to get past our insecticide. So they've developed a resistance to it. And when we asked how we could replace it with a new one, the one that the World Health Organization and the government of Malawi want us to use costs eight times what its predecessor did. 
So that means that our rate, our cost would go from $32,000 a year to protect about 40,000 people up to $125,000 a year, if my math is right. It was something like that. So something that's way out of our range. And I'm the biggest donator to Bridges to Malawi. So before I start any kind of a program, I reach into my own wallet, look at my bank account, and make sure I've got the money before I make any promises. So this is the first time that we were stuck with a damn, you know, we've made a promise that we're going to do this, and now we don't have the money for it. What are we going to do? So um, a miracle actually happened. At, at the same time that we were dealing, we were confronted with this problem, the government of Malawi decided to, to give away nets that are, for, that are insect, uh, insecticide impregnated mosquito nets. So that kills the mosquitoes or repels them to every two people in the entire country. And they're very effective. They cut the mortality rate, and they cut the, uh, the likelihood of generating malaria by about 55%. And they're used all over Africa, and they've been shown to do a really good job in reducing rates. Um, so they're very, very good when they're used properly. Um, so that solves our problem. We don't have to worry about that. So we don't have to do the IRS anymore. So I'll stop making that joke. Um, but we are in the malaria prevention business still. And here's how I want you to think about this. We'll talk about it in a few minutes. What would you think if I told you that you could put a plant, grow a plant in your garden that could prevent the disease that you are worse, most scared of? So let's say diabetes or cancer or high blood pressure or heart disease. Well, there is such a plant for malaria. It's called Artemisia annua. Um, and it's actually been studied for 25 years by a doctor named Pam Weathers who's at WPI right around the corner. So I had a chance to go meet with her. So we are introducing this plant to the area. And we'll talk a little more about it later. Next slide. So that's where we started. That was the emergency department stuff. So now we're doing the primary care stuff. What do you do to try to really fix this problem? Well, one thing is you look globally at it. This is what primary care doctors do. They don't just care about your blood pressure. They care about your cholesterol and your this and your that and your everything else. So that's the best way to deal with a problem like this is instead of picking one thing and concentrating on it, it's to try to do as many things as you can in the area where you can work. So that's how we're approaching the problem now, feeling that if we can give people a leg up that eventually, hopefully, they won't need us at all there. And that's the direction that I hope we're heading in. So these are all things that have been ongoing. Some of them go back for more than a year. Um, but we continue to do them, and we've upgraded them to some extent. So irrigation and wells, we actually have two wells that we've helped dig. They're all hand done, dug. So that $100 that you were talking about goes a long way. That's a third of a well in Malawi, 360 bucks, a little bit less than a third of a well. Um, and these two wells that we've dug so far are at secondary schools where kids have to walk a half an hour to be able to get water otherwise. We have a plan to dig another 20, both at secondary schools, which are high schools, and in villages all over the area where we work in 2019. They'll cost us about 7,000 bucks altogether to do that. Um, treadle pumps are foot pumps, so you stick a hose in the river and you use it by using the foot pump to get the water out of the river and it irrigates your crops and it can irrigate acres apparently. Um, so it helps the farmers deal with Dry times during the year, so Malawi has three seasons, a rainy season, a dry season, and a hungry season. A hungry season is when your crops run out and you have to wait until whatever you're growing can be harvested so you can feed yourself again. And that is determined to some extent by whether the rains fail or not as to how long it lasts. So during the dry season at least, if you can irrigate, you can continue to grow stuff. And there are rivers there, and so it's possible at least where the rivers are for us to be able to help these farmers not starve to death and also be able to feed their families, and to some extent, in a good year, put more money in their pocket so that they can educate their kids and also have a, a, a buffer in case the next year the rains fail on them. 80% of the population in Malawi are subsistence farmers. That means they live on what they grow. If they have a good year, they're fine. If they have a bad year, they starve. And I tell people, if you want to imagine what it's like there, Think of all the documentaries and newsreels that you've seen about in the 1930s, about the Great Depression in the United States. If you were to take Stowe and move it back to then, then maybe the roads were paved here at that point. But if they weren't, that would be Malawi. You don't see a lot of horse traffic, but you do see just about everything else you can imagine. So no electricity, no running water, roads that are horrible, terrible infrastructure, um, and a lot of dirt poor people who are desperate. And all of them want to get better. So what happened to us, what made us who we are sitting in this room today, is what we're trying to do there. We're trying to bring them 80 years into the, into, um, you know, to from, from where they are to our present, because they're 80 years in the past, basically. So we've given away animals. We gave over 520, 60 goats. I can't remember the exact number now. 
And they're continuing to do that because the goats breed, and as they, get, as they breed, they're passed on. So the people who are the beneficiaries get the firstborn goat, and then the other goats they can sell. When we were there, and I might have a picture, it's one of the pictures that you saw with somebody pointing to a goat. I was told that woman got her first goat about a year and a half ago from us. She has six goats now. She'll sell five of them, and those five goats will make enough money for her to be able to send two of her kids to high school. So think about that. Again, why are we in this room? Because somewhere our ancestors were these subsistence farmers, and somewhere they got enough money to get education or to get their kids educated, and that broke that cycle of poverty. And that's what we're trying to do. So if we can get their kids to high school, that gives them a chance to learn more stuff that's more useful. Hopefully, you know, some of them will go on to college, but they can move off the farm if they want to, get into the city, and have, we're giving them skills that will make it so that they'll be, have, be able to get jobs there. And or they can stay on the farm but learn how to be more effective in what they grow. So more effective, nobody mulches there. We do it without giving it a second thought. So we're teaching them about that. Um, and there are many other things that you can do, but the major issue in terms of conservation agriculture is to keep the topsoil from going away. So if you plow a field the way you're used to seeing in the newsreels, or for those of you that grew up on a farm, you turn that topsoil up, it's gone. So now what they're doing is a thing called a Magoye Ripper. It just runs a little line, straight like that, and the seeds go in the line, and you don't mess with the topsoil on either side. Um, and that's being introduced all over Africa. So we bought one. We're waiting to see if the farmers like it enough, and I understand that they do now. Um, so that we will actually have somebody making them. So we're setting up a little business there for some other individual to make money selling these to the other farmers. And hopefully that will increase their crop yields. Supposedly it can double their crop yields. And land lease is a program that I stole the, the idea from Franklin Roosevelt, the name sort of. Um, but it keeps the poorest farmers on the land. That's what I wrote down there. It turns out that it's done more than that. So two-thirds to three-quarters of the beneficiaries, and we probably had about 100 people in this program, have been able to buy their own land. A lot of the farmers there are tenant farmers, they're sharecroppers. They stay on the land that they don't own, and they, they're able to pay the rent out of the crops that they grow, assuming they have a decent enough crop. But they've got to pay the landlord first. And if they can't do that, then they get kicked off the land. And if they can do that, but they don't have a decent enough crop, then they starve. If they've got their own land, then it gives them a tremendous amount of, of, of um, choice in terms of what's going to happen next to them. So being able to do this for the farmers has been huge. And it's not like they come back and say, we want more. We made a point of saying that this program was going to be for a year. It's 20 bucks for tools and seeds, and then 10 bucks a month for a year for the farmers. And most of these farmers have graduated, if you want to use that word, from this program now because they don't need us anymore. That's the plan. OK, next slide. We also have a microcredit bank. I tell people we steal everybody's ideas. So my wife and I, we give a lot of money to charities, and so they send us their annual reports. So Kiva sends us stuff, and Heifer sends us stuff, um, and we steal their ideas. So there is no Kiva where we work, so we're, we're Kiva. So we've given over 400 loans. We have a 98% payback rate. Um, the women, and this is just to women, we were told, don't give money to guys. They blow it on booze and girls. So we, and, they, and these are groups of women. We're told don't give to a single individual because if that one doesn't turn out to be good, there's no peer pressure. But if you give it to a group of eight women, believe me, there's enough peer pressure there that nobody bails on you. So there are women, as a consequence of this, that have started their own restaurants, that have their own little marketplaces, um, that there's one who has a bakery and a tea shop. And our favorite story, so you, you can kick me out if I run on, but I've got to tell the story. So <clears throat> my orthopedic partner, Don Hangin, is a Mormon. And one of the things that Don didn't like about this program was too many women were making donuts. And he thought, that's just not creative, and it's not sustainable. And I, th and I thought, hey, you know, they know the economy better than we do. If this works for them, that's fine. But he wanted something more creative. So he just went back to Malawi. He was there for a, an orthopedic conference. And he came back and he said, you're not going to believe this. He said, the most successful person that we have who's been a beneficiary, the microcredit bank, by the way, is like a $10 loan to start with, with a $15 follow-up. We're talking about 25 bucks to turn the lives of these people tremendously in a different direction. So the most successful person, she's making booze. <laughs> and apparently she's doing a really good job. So I said, the Great Depression, we got FDR, all we needed was Al Capone. Now I got her too. <laughs> Next slide, please. OK, so that's the stuff that I may have talked about before. So what's new? So solar powering schools, we have done seven. Um, and we've also donated um, laptops to five schools. 
Now I'm going to stop there and let Nao talk about that because this is her project um, along with Jen Hardy who's an IT teacher um, at Worcester Tech. So Nao is a chemical engineer but she's really skilled in computers and so this is what she's been doing. Um, I'm a chemical engineer. I work at Genzyme in Framingham, if, uh, if you have heard of them. Um, and I very much caught the bug of Bridges to Malawi a couple years ago. So I've now gone on two trips and will be returning again um, this upcoming April. So a little bit about the program that Brian mentioned. So we, ha um, I don't even remember how this even started, about whose idea it was. But basically what we do is we have donated laptops from uh, predominantly from GE, but from other companies as well, who donate laptops to us. Um, but that's only part of the equation, because you can imagine, there's no electricity, no running water, there's certainly not any internet, and powering your laptops gets a little bit confusing. So what we have been able to combine is, um, first of all, providing solar power to these schools. So first of all, you can power your computers, but you can also power light bulbs, which lets these students study at night. So you've, you know, separate even from the laptops, you've allowed a whole other level of educational abilities, especially for a lot of these kids who have responsibilities like chores and farming during the daylight hours. So we just massively expanded their educational opportunities. And then secondly, we're powering the laptops themselves. You might wonder, how in the world do laptops help in the developing world when you've got dirt roads and certainly no internet? So there's another tool for that. <laughs> we have downloaded huge sections of the internet. Um, we've partnered with educational folks who got very smart. There are many, many, many modern educational tools like Wikipedia or um, Khan Academy videos, if you've ever heard of these, or even whole downloaded textbooks, uh, even like village medicine textbooks to that level, all of which is downloaded onto each of these laptops. And the great part about all of that as well is it keeps the, the user interface of the internet. So we're not just providing the information that all of these tools provide, but we're also giving these students the ability to just practice with what, what are computers, what is it all about. And where we start with is how, where's the power button? You know, how do you turn this thing on? That's where we start. And what we're giving with, you know, we're planting seeds for the future. We're giving a lot of these kids the opportunity to just see something for the first time. Because it's terrifying to experience this huge jump in technology when you're growing up in this rural farm. And our hope for these students is that they make it to university, that they make it beyond, that they are the next entrepreneurs of Malawi, of Africa, of the world. And so what we want to do is just give them this tiny seed at the educational secondary high school level to be able to have the opportunity that I certainly had growing up in this country with my grandparents who are immigrants. And we want to be able to give that in a way that's comforting and, and welcoming. And so that's what we start with. And so we started the solar powering schools. We've now done, the laptops have been five schools now. And we've got 35 laptops on our backs last year and they just keep coming. Um, and one of my favorite photos actually is the one on top there. When we go to these schools to teach, there are literally kids climbing in the windows to come listen to us. It's a little bit different than getting your kids to school in America. So this is really something that they understand so inherently what this means. And it's, gosh, it's so much fun. <laughs> it's a really a, a high to do this every day for the short period we're there. Okay. All right, I'm done. I'm already over. Like me, she'll go on and on. Runs the family. All right, I'm done. Runs the family. Um, but I should say... I think there were 441 students that benefited from this program. Two of them had seen a computer before. Um, so that should tell you something about it. And also, none of them knew how to type. So even if they don't do the computer part, they're learning how to type off of this. So that also gives them a skill. And the other thing that's in these laptops is conservation agriculture stuff. So we're not trying to get people to leave the farm. The idea is to give them the choices. So if they want to stay in the farm, let's make the farm, the farm work better. But if they want to go into the city and then send money back to mom and dad and the rest of the family, which is the model that all of us, again, have benefited from, um, the, if you think about how our demographics have, have shifted in the last 100 years, um, then that's an opportunity we're providing them with. So we also have a girls' empowerment curriculum. Um, what we did with that is Malawi is girls are second-class citizens to some extent. Um, but the teachers don't believe that. And so we worked with them to work out a variety of different things. One is the Mooncatcher Project, which I'm, I probably mentioned last year, which are reusable, washable menstrual pads. So if you're a girl 
and you're in, the, in um, Malawi or a lot of the other parts of the developing world, usually the guys are the ones that pick what color the skirt is that you're going to wear, and they're usually white or very light pastel colors. Really, hide to hard to, really hard to hide a menstrual period if you're stuck with that, and the girls don't often have underwear. So this makes it possible for them to go to school, because otherwise, if they're menstruating, they stay home, and then they drop behind, and then they drop out. And the dropout rates are very high. So the Mooncatcher project is not our project, but we brought them there, and we're working with them. And part of what they do is they give sewing machines. We actually bought some ourselves. Um, and the women who make it, make the Mooncatchers, have a certain amount that they're supposed to make every month, and then they can use the sewing machines for their own purposes. So it starts a business on top of what they're doing to help the community. And the Mooncatchers are given away for free. So the other part of this was we found an African movie. It's called The Queen of Cotway. I hope you've all seen it. If you haven't, you should all go see it. It's set in Uganda, and it's about a girl who grows up dirt poor in the city of Kampala. So it's not rural, it's city, but she's dirt poor, not very well educated, doesn't have a lot of options for the future, and she becomes a chess master. She's so good at it that she beats the hell out of everybody she plays, including the boys. Mm -hmm. So that was why we like this model, because it's African, it's about an African girl, and it's clear that she's much better than the boys are when it comes to playing chess. So we brought chess sets with us. We brought copies of the movie. We had a movie night in town. We had the high school kids sitting in there. After the movie, they broke out into groups, and the ones who knew how to play chess already started playing. And the biggest moment for me that was part of this was when two boys were playing, and one boy pointed to the other boy and said, he's the Fiona of this area. Fiona is the female <laughs> character from the movie. So he had already gotten the message that she was the ideal that he was supposed to be looking up to. And it didn't matter to him that she was a girl. So we actually donated this to the schools, and we're hoping to see how this transpires in, in the long run. Um, next slide. <coughs> we're also do re, doing reforestation. Uh, we're actually at 60,000 right now, but the plan before the end of the year is 80,000 trees. You know, so they get it, we get it too, but if you're a subsistence farmer, the climate change is much harder on you than it is on us. So they desperately need to do whatever they can to keep this from becoming a disaster, because they'll all starve. Next slide. I mentioned the Mooncatcher project. Oh, I forgot to bring the palm of soap with me. So when, I, when you do what, you, what I do, people just appear from nowhere on the internet and they say, oh, you worked in Malawi, can we work with you? So these people, these students at the University of Edinburgh had this program to make an insect repellent soap called palm of soap, and they wanted us to be the go-between. So they actually went to Malawi, they worked with our colleagues there, and they have, again, established an industry where women are making the soap, and the soap is very effective, apparently, in keeping the insects away. And, 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 Mosquitoes carry malaria, so this is another way to prevent it. Next slide. So I mentioned Artemisia. That's the plant that grows, that prevents malaria. It's prevented in that the leaves of the plant have 20 different compounds that are, have anti-malarial properties. One of those compounds is so effective that it actually is the cause, it's the source of the go-to drug for treating malaria. It's called artesamine, and, and, and the IV drug is artusinate. Um, but apparently, if you take the leaves and you crush them up, the whole thing is even more effective than just that one drug. So it's not a reason to stop using the one drug, but in those patients that are going to die no matter what, there are studies that show that if you use the crushed up leaves and you make a capsule and you give it as an enema or something like that, it actually saves the lives of those people that are dying when they're just getting the one drug. Better than that, you can make a tea, which tastes very terrible, but you can still make it. And if you drink it once a week, it reduces your likelihood of getting malaria by about 30 to 50 percent, depending on the studies you've read. So you're probably going to hear a lot more about this. It's being introduced mostly in West Africa, but we're bringing it to Malawi. Um, and hopefully that, they'll be planting it very soon because the rains have started there and this is the planting season. We're going to try to do an HPV vaccination program. This is all going to be about whether we can afford the vaccine or not. Doctors Without Borders is doing it in the entire country of the Philippines, and so they got a discount rate from some international organization for 28 bucks a girl. HPV causes cervical cancer. Malawi has the highest rate in the world of it. So it's definitely something we want to prevent. If we can't get the discount, we can't afford to do this because it's 130 bucks a girl now. And our target population will probably be somewhere in the order of 2,600 to 9,600 girls, depending on the, on the uh, um, amount of money that's available to us and how much the things cost. We're going to donate some ultrasounds. We're actually bringing a radiology resident, somebody who's about to graduate and become a radiologist with us this year. So he's going to teach them how to use it. Ultrasound is incredible because it can keep you from having to buy an x-ray department that you can't afford in a place like Malawi. 
you can diagnose pneumonia and fractures and all kinds of things that you, we're all used to using x-ray for, just using ultrasound. And the devices are something you plug into your smartphone and it turns the smartphone screen to the ultrasound that you're looking at. That's how cool they are. They cost 2000 bucks a pop, so we're going we're to buy three of them. Um, we already have a fetal monitoring thing there that somebody's testing. Um, so it's an American organization that's trying to make this available for the developing world. And we've already been told that it's saved, I think it was six or seven babies so far. Um, because it tells you when the baby's in distress and when you have to do a C-section right away. <clears throat> We may be partnering with a brand new medical school. Malawi has one medical school, so this is the second one that's opening up. We have connections with the colleagues who are actually starting the school, and so they're interested in having us partner. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to work this into my life, but it would be kind of cool to make it happen. Um, and then the free care pool, even though um, health care is free in theory if you're going to a government hospital, the trouble with a government hospital is when they get a month's allotment of stuff, in two weeks it's gone. So they send their patients to St. Andrews, which is the rural hospital that we work at, which is a semi-private hospital. So they charge people, and they have a sliding scale. And I asked them once, how do you decide who to charge and who not to? And the answer was, we tell by their clothing. So if they look poor, we assume they're poor, and we don't charge them as much, and we might give them free care. So we started something that actually exists in our country, that this is what it's called, a free care pool. And maybe you don't know about it, but I do because I'm a doctor. So the federal government and the states all reimburse hospitals for people that get taken care of who have no insurance and no way of being able to pay for their health care. That's, that's what a free care pool is. So 300 bucks a month we give to help people get health care or for the logistical part. If they need to be able to go two and a half hours to the capital city to get a CAT scan that they otherwise couldn't make happen, we take care of that for them. Next slide. So how do you fix deforestation when people are cutting the trees down right and left and even if you plant 80,000 trees, maybe it's not going to make a difference? You give them something that's more renewable. I'd rather they didn't burn anything. But if they're going to burn something, this is something else that's cutting edge. They're introducing bamboo all over sub-Saharan Africa. Bamboo is a grass. So when you cut it off at the bottom, it grows just like you just mowed the lawn. And you can make better charcoal out of it than you can from wood. You can also use the leaves for fodder for your animals. And you can use it for construction material. So we just uh, closed the deal yesterday. We're, we're having uh, 5,800 bamboo seeds for a particular drought-resistant kind of bamboo shipped from Kenya down to Malawi, and it's going to be planted all over the place there. So 20 years from now, when it destroys the environment and takes over, I'm the guy who they're going to blame. But for now, it's going to help. Um, food preservation. We all take for granted pickles and cheese and things like that. But have you ever thought about where all that stuff came from? It's all ancient ways, pre-electricity, of preserving your food. So I've actually taught myself how to make cheese. I'm eight months into it now. I'm still alive eating my own cheese. I haven't gotten sick at all. Um, and we're going to teach them how to do that. Pickling stuff is the same thing. It's very easy to do. It requires salt and water and time. Um, and it have a lot of sunshine there. So we have built a solar dehydrator, and you're actually working on sort of the 2.0 version of it to make it even cheaper. So that especially when they have the mango harvest, they won't have to throw most of the food away. They can dry it and eat it. Um, and then there's a dairy cooperative. So that's a 10-year plan, maybe sooner than that. We'll see. But the idea is to actually set up an industry. There are cows there. There are people that own them and milk them. But they, nobody's working together to try to end up with a market and to try to pool their resources. And the dirt poor farmers don't have any access to any of this. So we want to buy a herd of cows. I think it's going to be 30. And have a facility that gets constructed, which includes a place where the milk gets chilled. And have a yogurt separator and develop a market so that we can actually make it so that people get employed and they have opportunities economically that they wouldn't have otherwise. Now, this isn't the pie in the sky thing. Heifer did it 150 miles away in Tanzania. And it took him about 10 years. So we're working along the same timeline, we hope, but we'll see. Next slide. So as I mentioned, that. Next slide. This is where Malawi is, in case you don't know. It's all the way down here in southeastern Africa. Next slide. That's what the country looks like. Next slide. Next slide. So um, let me just go back to that other slide. So. Part of the fallout of what we do, and this is also something else I haven't mentioned, is I give talks in high schools, and I'm also taking these high school kids with us. They're going to inherit this climate change thing from us, among other things. So they have to learn how to problem solve. This is about problem solving. What's sustainable? What does that mean? How do you figure it out? So um, I asked them about that in a little bit of the talk that I'm giving you right now. We'll just show you something about this, the slides that I showed them. Next slide. Next slide. This is why we do it. So these are actually the parents at the what, what's called the, is it the hostel? I can't remember what it's called. But this is the people who are taking care of the sick relatives in the hospital. 
they built them a facility, so they're outside with their cooking fires, and then they'll spend the night in a room uh, where a Dutch medical student just bought them a bunch of mosquito nets and bedding because they didn't have any of that before. Next slide. That's a typical dwelling. Next slide. Next slide. That's, that's what the infrastructure looks like. Next slide. That's how you say good morning. It also means did you sleep well. Mazuka Banji. Next slide. These are our high school kids and charity. Next slide. Okay. Next slide. So I tell the story. This is from our Nicaragua days, even though this ambulance is a Malawian one. The first year we went to Nicaragua, they proudly showed us this ambulance that the European Union had donated. And I said, that's fabulous. You guys got an ambulance. And they said, there's only one problem. Anybody want to guess what the problem is? Yeah. That's right. They didn't give them any gasoline money. So when you're doing development, you got to think stuff through. Next slide. <laughs> so this is what I showed the high school kids. It's basically, you know, what's the good and the bad and the ugly of how you're trying to do things. So we try to think things through. We, try to, we, we don't just come up with a project and dump it on the Malawians. We talk about this. Peter, can you plant bamboo? Is this a good idea? Is it a bad idea? What do you think of it? And if he agrees, then we work on the process of how we're going to make it happen. Next slide. Love that proverb. This is all about malaria. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so this is just a little bit about malaria. Big problem. It's better. This is in part because of the nets. So there's been, um, next slide. This is where you see malaria, where it's brown. Next slide. Next slide. Look at the numbers there. This is three quarters of the population of Boston died every year. Next slide. Next slide. So that's what happens with the nets. So it's not us. This is the Gates Foundation and the Clinton Foundation and the World Health Organization. But they've managed to reduce, even in sub-Saharan Africa, the number of cases and the mortality a lot in the last 15 years. Got a long way to go. Next slide. Everywhere you see green, that's a World Health Organization slide, there's less malaria. In some places, there isn't even malaria. I tell people, you know, see the gray hair? If you tell me the word malaria from, from what I grew up with in the movies, I think of the Philippines and Vietnam. It's gone from both of those places now. So where it still is is where you see orange. And where you see white in Africa, it's because the governments are so screwed up there, they can't even give data to the World Health Organization. So that's not a good sign. Next slide. This is just to remind you, who have, if you haven't seen the slide before, that huge problems are fixable. You could start out by saying, why are you even thinking about getting malaria out of the continent of Africa? It's impossible, you can't do that. Well, there's part of a continent. Everywhere you see cross-hatching up there, there was malaria. The reason it stops at the Canadian border is this is US data. It went up into Canada. It was in Boston. And it's gone completely because our government took care of it. So yes, you can eradicate it. And you hopefully can do it without DDT and draining every swamp and, you know, all over the place. Next slide. So. Ebola, everybody got all hysterical about. Look at the difference in the numbers, if you remember them. 11,314 deaths versus 438,000 a year. This wasn't even a year. This was one year, and Ebola's gone. Why were we scared about it? Because we didn't want to come here. Everybody thinks we won't get malaria here. Next slide. Next slide. So I showed this to the kids because I wanted them to understand about how changes have been made. There's this really cool test where you can just prick somebody's finger and a one drop of blood, and you can tell whether that person's got malaria or not. So some scientists had to figure that out, but it's changed what happens in Africa tremendously. Next slide. This is old-fashioned way of approaching things. This is inside the St. Andrew's Hospital. Sometimes they have patients sleeping on the floor when they don't have enough room. Next slide. This is a Dutch medical student. What do we do with the nets? Well, the trouble with the nets is they get holes in them. So it's really not a good day when you're making rounds in the hospital and you see the mosquitoes buzzing around inside the net with the patient. So we actually make net rounds. We go through there and we, we sit them back up again. Next slide. She, put, she talked us out of money. She did a GoFundMe page. She had enough money to put mosquito screens, I mean, insect repelling screens on all the windows of the hospital, which had not been there before. Next slide. And bought new mosquito nets as well. So those are the indoor residual sprayers. History. Next slide. Anybody want to buy them? That's the Palma soap. So they make it as these huge, long things, and they cut them into small pieces. Next slide. This is a little bit about how you make artemisia tea. Next slide. So this is Peter Manjali, our African colleague. He's the guy that runs things there. Um, and he is making capsules out of the ground up leaf of the artemisia. Next slide. This is a pulse oximeter. So again, when I was her age, learning how to practice medicine, if we wanted to know what a person's oxygen level was, we stuck a needle in the artery. That's how we figured it out. Almost none of you probably, I'm not sure anybody in this room has ever had that done to them. And that's because we've got these cool things now 
that do it with you know through technology. So again, a, a way for medic for people who are in high school to figure what can they do to help and make a difference. Next slide. This is a small vibrating portable nebulizer. Next slide. There's an ultrasound machine, which we donated. So this is a big old one. So I love this slide. Go, go ahead. Next slide. Does anybody know what that is? And so, you know, some wagon that, you know, in the audience always says, that's a stapler. It's like, forget about that. I'm asking you about this. Huh? Listen to a woman scrapping. Close. The baby. That's right. So my wife was a labor and delivery nurse who <laughs> retired after 40 years. She learned on these things. And I can remember the earpiece going with something like this when I was a medical student. So this is the old-fashioned pre-ultrasound way of hearing a baby's heartbeat. And they still use it there. Next slide. So another cool thing, we grew up in Polaroids. Her generation had no idea what a Polaroid was, but they just discovered it. So there's a Polaroid. So one of the things that we do when we go to Africa is we're always taking pictures of everybody, including especially the kids. Everybody loves it, but it's all digital. So I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could actually leave the pictures behind for the moms? So the deal that I had with her was, None of the grown-ups, because we didn't have enough film, but she was to take a picture of every single kid in this crowd and then hand the picture to the parent. And you would not believe how happy those mothers were because they have nothing on the walls. They have no way of, of documenting anything about their kids except what they remember. So this is a huge moment for them. So we're going to increase the amount of film that we take this year. Next slide. So one of the things we have to be is flexible. Flexible means if you run out of room, well, you can turn a van into a doctor's office. That's what's happening there. Next slide. This is an oral way of fixing malaria. So, you know, we're all, we all have this idea that somehow if you get sick, you have to have a doctor or a nurse if it's not your mother taking care of you. Um, and if it's malaria, you need a doctor or a nurse. You don't need a doctor or a nurse. What you need is somebody in the village who knows how to use this stuff. And on the back, it actually gives you weight based two tabs for this kid if he's this age, three if he's this age, four if he's that age. And if you start the kids on the anti-malarial when they first get sick, a lot of them don't end up in the hospital and a lot of them don't die. Next slide. Next slide. So this is, imagine a corn crop at the height of the summer in Massachusetts. It should be green. That's what it was supposed to look like. So this is what it looked like during a drought. Next slide. That's tobacco. That's the other thing that they grow. So they grow these two things. Tobacco is their cash crop, and corn is what they live on and fill their bellies with, which has a very low nutritional value. Next slide. So what do you do to prevent famine? Well, I can't fix the rain, but we can store stuff. So... I had this dream, you know, I, I couldn't get past the Joseph story, you know, with Pharaoh's dream and the seven bad years, seven good years, seven bad years. So anyway, we built a storage facility, and they named it after my wife, which I thought was very cool. So it's called Cindy's House. So the Moon Catcher Project actually is in here. They have a palliative care group that meets in the middle, and then over here is where they're storing the grain. And my wife, the dairy farmer's daughter, said, what are you going to do about the mice? So there's a high-tech way to approach that problem and a low-tech way to approach that problem. And you know what? Anybody want to know what the? How many people here know what the low-tech way is? Yes. That's right. Next slide. She's really cute. Next slide. So there's the grain. Next slide. Next slide. And there's the mouse mitigation project. <laughs> so they, they let the cat out periodically. And actually, there were two cats, but I guess one of them ran away. So I said, you know, you got to get the cat a cat. This isn't fair. Next slide. Next slide. So I mentioned food preservation. This is a typical market. Next slide. Notice no refrigeration, no electricity. Next slide. That's the way that you get your produce to market. Not good during the rainy season. Next slide. That's also part of a road, believe it or not. It's also half lake. Next slide. Next slide. So the problem with canning is if you need to burn stuff, then that's not the direction we want to go in. So we're trying to figure out, and I've been playing with this at home, how do you can things by just putting it in there and letting it, letting it uh, um, be preserved that way. You can make sauerkraut that way. It actually tastes more like kimchi, but that's my latest thing. Pretty good. Next slide. So I put this slide in here because once upon a time, and not 200 years ago, not 100 years ago, but in the 1970s, this entire landscape was treed, completely covered with trees. So look at that ridge there. There's almost no trees on it. That's what's happening there. They are merrily tearing down every single tree that grows there because they, they have to cook. And so that's where their charcoal comes from. Next slide. So pickling is a way to solve this problem. You don't have to burn stuff. Next slide. This is the thing they're already doing. So they take maize and they take beans and they put it out in the sun. So we want to teach them to do that with fruits. Next slide. That's a picture of the solar dehydrator. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. 
Okay, next one. This is wood, and they're probably deforesting from a place that even shouldn't be, you know, it's illegal. Next slide. And everywhere you look, you'll see people with charcoal, that's what that is. Next slide. Or wood, or both. Next slide. So we need to fix this problem. So that's what the bamboo's about, and that's why we're also planting trees. And we're not just doing this. We're doing this in partner with villages. They took us to this cool village where we were introduced to the keepers of the forest. And this was a group of people who are farmers who are spending their spare time planting trees that we've given them. Now, the scary thing is they pointed to the forest that they had left. There were 20 trees there. So it's not a good thing if a country, you know, the people in a country consider a forest to be 20 trees. Next slide. And this is actually a picture of that. There's the forest over there. This is all trees that we're planting right now. And the keepers of the forest are some of the people here. So this is, again, Peter Minjali, our colleague. I put him here because behind him are part of 2,500 trees that were planted around um, K2 Tasso, which is our sister organization. They're building their headquarters. And these trees are moringa trees, which have a lot of really cool properties, including herbal uh, medicine-type properties and protein. And they grow so fast that they were this tall when he planted them a year ago. And look at how tall they are. They're as tall as he is. They're probably five or six feet now. Next slide. This is what they look like to begin with. Next slide. In America, if you had a legend on a map that said trees, there would be one dot, and it would have the word tree underneath it, right? So in Malawi, they hired some poor guy to put a tree for every one of the 2,500 trees that they planted there <laughs> on this map. And down here is a key that tells you what different kinds are. So it isn't just one kind. They're planting fruit trees because they realize the economic and nutritious value of that. But they're also planting other things that provide shade, act as windbreaks, and the moringa, which has a lot of different cool, really cool properties. Next slide. This is a picture of women who are planting the more recent ones. So that, that was um, the, one, the map that I just showed you is from last year. This is going on right now. So there actually are tree seedlings in here. So when I tell you 60,000 trees, we're not talking about trees. We're talking about this. But as the rains come, very shortly, these things shoot up. And within a short period of time, if they're moringa or some of the other ones that they're picking because they're fast growers, they're real trees within a year. Next slide. Next slide. This is actually from one of the secondary schools, one of the high schools we went to. So like I said, they get it. They're teaching their kids about this. Next slide. Next slide. So if you are a woman in Malawi, in addition to the menstrual problem we talked about, you also are screwed in a lot of other ways. This is one of them. You get stuck being the water carrier. So imagine, think about those buckets. They're totally full of water. And you might have to walk miles before you get from wherever you're getting it, just for the family, let alone to irrigate the crops. So it's a huge problem. That's why we're drilling wells, and that's why there's irrigation there. Next slide. And the water's not safe. You drill a well, it's safe water. Next slide. There's a the treadle pump. Next slide. We also have been involved in the construction of some earthen dams. That's what this is. They're standing on a dam, and there's a river there. This is to try to produce to make sure that there's enough water to irrigate the fields all around it. My partner who was just there, this is Don hanging with his back to you, said that since we always go in the rainy season, he said you would not believe what it's like. I would because I lived in California. So during the dry season, everything is dry. He said it might go months before there's any rain. But what he said was wherever there was a dam or a river and there were treadle pumps, the fields were all green and well irrigated. Once you got inland from that, because the rains aren't going on for a couple months, the farmers get one crop, and that's during the rainy season, and that's that. So we're actually giving people a couple crops a year. And again, it's the same issue. You put more food in their bellies. If they're better nourished, they're actually much more likely to be able to, su to survive getting sick. They're less likely to get malaria and things like that. And if they do, they're more tolerant of it um, because they're tougher. And in addition, you're also putting money in their pockets so that they can educate their kids. Next slide. These are just all the lovely parasites. This is in the hospital laboratory that you can get from drinking the wrong water. Next slide. That is an outhouse. Next slide. Next slide. I mentioned this already. Somebody doesn't know how to spell preservation. So this is a guy who's supposed to be teaching the people who come to the hospital how to grow their crops better. He wasn't mulching. So we had a long talk with him. Next slide. This is Peter pointing out the goat. So I already told you the story of the woman that had one goat, and she ended up with six altogether. So he was just telling us the story. Next slide. This is one of the many villages that we went to where we asked the question, how many of you in this room got a goat from us? See all the hands? Isn't that cool? No. Next slide. So we also have been giving cows away. So we're going to be in, if we're going into the milk business, you know, it's really wild. I'm a Jewish kid from a suburb in Maryland. What do I know about dairy stuff? 
I'm sitting next to my wife as I'm Skyping Africa saying, she grew up on a dairy farm. We're talking about Jerseys and Holsteins and how much milk you get from this one and whether there's a protein in it. It's like, you know, I, I never would have guessed and neither would she that, that her husband is now in the dairy business. But it turns out that Holsteins, which are the black and white cows, and Jerseys, which are the brown ones that you see around here, they are all, they actually do okay in Malawi. And a Jersey will give you 15 liters of milk a day. These guys give you two. A Holstein will give you 20 liters of milk a day. But the difference is the Holstein's milk doesn't have as much protein and fat in it. So we're going to go with jerseys. Um, so at some point we'll be buying them and at some point we'll be breeding them. But the, at least the herd we have so far, which were purchased mostly to pull plows, still give some milk. They give manure. They're actually serving their purpose in lots of different ways. We started out with, I think we paid for 24. We're up to 32 now. What do they have to feed them? So grass, I don't know what they do during the dry season, but probably hay. Next slide. This was somebody's house, but now it's used more as a barn. Next slide. Next slide. I already mentioned that. Next slide. So this is one of the secondary schools that we went to. Um, there's Jen Hardy, who is Neo's alter ego, the high school IT teacher. And the two of them do this amazing thing. So I'll be in the hospital, or I'll be out in the development uh, looking at stuff. They just spend a whole day at one school. And they're teaching the chiefs and the PTA and the parents and everybody that's interested how to use these computers. Um, and we actually, through WhatsApp, have the ability to continue to do this even when we've come back here. So Jen is in constant contact, and we have hired one person um, who also is there to sort of troubleshoot to make sure that it isn't just like we went and we're going to come back in a year and nothing's changed. It's to try to keep this evolving so that when we come back, we're adding to what's already been built there as opposed to starting from scratch again. It's not a perfect project, but it's worked really well. This is a different school with the same, same idea. Next slide. So there's Nao, and she's uh, just taking us through a little bit about what the computers can do. Next slide. Next slide. And I think that's Jen there, probably, right? This is inside one of the schools. Next slide. This is some of the educational tools I was talking about. Mm -hmm. So this is, no, this is all offline, but it looks a whole lot it like It looks like you're on the internet. So it's like the internet without the internet. And they have videos that teach you physics and biology and chemistry. It's really cool. Um, and the entire English language library. So all of Shakespeare's works, Hemingway, Fitzgerald, you name it, it's all in there. So this is actually, that was, go back that one slide. So we had a meeting first with the teachers. So this is Nao actually talking to them. Um, and we talked about the girls' empowerment and um, about the moon catcher in addition to the computers. And she was asking questions about, you know, how do we, because this is the idea is we're working together here. This isn't just us telling them you're going to do this. It's like, what can we do? How do we do this? What do you know about computers? What don't you know about computers? And to show you how much of a family thing this is, this is Nao's mother, who's also a chemical engineer, who came to help out. Next slide. So this is again is in another school. Next slide. We made it in Malawi national news, by the way, um, because of the donation of the solar power and the laptops. Next slide. Next slide. So if we have enough time, I have to tell you the story. So we we stopped to pick up the comedians. And now Malawi in English is accented, like you probably have heard some Africans speak English, and you can know it's different from our English. And so once in a while, I'm not sure I caught the word correctly. So they said, we're stopping to pick up the comedians. And I thought, committee members? You know, what are we talking about here? So we picked up these four people who were not dressed like this at this point, and we went out to one of the schools. And this is the first school that we had donated solar power to and laptops. And so they wanted to have a ceremony. It turned out they were comedians. So they did this really cool thing. So if you can imagine, we're introducing 21st century technology to this place using the 5th century technique. So here we are outside under a tree with the high school kids all like that and the big wigs like me sitting in plastic chairs like this on the other side. And they're thanking us and introducing us, you know, and who we are and what we're there. And then the comedians come out, and they basically had four skits talking about computers and why they were good and what was cool about them and how parents who are old-fashioned should understand why it's a good thing for their kids to learn about these things, and why the chief shouldn't steal them. So they picked on everybody, the high school kids, the teachers, the headmaster, everybody they picked, the chiefs, and then they turned on us. <laughs> Next slide. So there he is, in white face, with white gloves, acting like an American. And he was so funny that by the time we were finished at the fourth school, I had given him my cell phone, my water bottle, my hat, and my camera. 
and he was using them all as props and calling Donald Trump and talking to him um, and making fun of our accents and the fact that we're constantly drinking water when we're there. Um, but he had the crowd in hysterics, and at the same time, they're really doing a good job of getting everybody to understand that these are precious things that need to be treated properly, and they also represent opportunities that they wouldn't have otherwise. Next slide. So when we go, our team always tries to leave something behind. This is the something. So we leave a lot of things behind, but this is the permanent thing. So in the PD ward, we have a, a mural that's put up every year. It's not the same place. So that we have a wall from every year that we've gone up through 2018. But we thought this was a particularly good one because it's the Lorax, and we were dealing with um, deforestation and climate change. Next slide. So this is one of the secondary schools. These are the solar panels right up here. It turns out that Two wasn't enough, so we actually needed to add a third one. The original cost, I think, was about seven, eight hundred bucks, so it's gone up to about a thousand to do a school. And we're planning on not just finishing the secondary schools that haven't been done, but then we want to go to the primary schools for the same obvious reason. We want the kids to be able to study at night, but we also want the primary school kids to grow up with computers because that makes it a lot easier to use them, just like our children are doing. Next slide. You would not believe the looks on these teachers' faces. Look at how this room is not furnished. There's basically nothing in there. They pointed up at these light bulbs, which were off when we went to the room, and then somebody threw a switch, and you would, thought, you would think that God had come down and was talking to all of us. It was such a miracle to them that five light bulbs would go on and, and, and illuminate the inside of the school. Next slide. This is just the battery converting system to make the solar power work. Next slide. <laughs> so this is um, the night of the movie. This is right afterwards. So one of the things that Neo brought was a microscope. That's a microscope. It's an origami microscope, which worked pretty well, didn't it? So, you know, again, sort of a brilliant idea that's dirt cheap that we could use to, to help the kids learn how to use things that, you know, buying a microscope costs a lot of money, but this didn't cost much of anything. And over there, people are playing chess. Next slide. So Neo, Neo remembers this as a kid looking at the computers. I remember this as a kid because I've seen it too, violating HIPAA. So when we're doing clinic, we often have little kids looking through the windows. Next slide. That's a hen house. Next slide. This is a potter. Next slide. So these are the moon catchers. So there's Ellie von Welsheim. She's the woman that started it. And Neo and Neo's mom and Maggie, right? Um, and then some people that are working on uh, making the moon catchers. And Ellie's got this whole production line set up. Next slide. And her friend is actually going to model the moon catcher for you. Next slide. There she is putting it on. Next slide. Thank God she didn't ask me. Next slide. So this is just how you dry things there. Next slide. Next slide. This is inside what's called the girls' hostel. So the girls have to walk to high school, and it's too far. This is where they stay. This is what it looks like. So we were asked to build some buildings for them to make uh, and furnish them better. So we're thinking about trying to do that this year. Next slide. There's a newborn. Next slide. Again, this is why we go, which is why we take our high school kids. Look at the look on her face and look at the kid. Next slide. And that's my favorite picture. <laughs> this was Sam McLaughlin. So she's from Hudson. She won last year. She's in college now. Next slide. And that's it. We're waving goodbye. Thank you very much. Let me just point out to you that the reason, in part, that we've accomplished this is because you people stood behind me from the very beginning. You know, you've never said no when I've asked for money. You've made me learn how to have chutzpah to ask for money. Um, but you've also, in many, many ways, inspired me to think that there's a lot more that we could be doing there. So thank you all, because your lines are awesome. Thank you very much, Brian. Can I say something? Uh, Absolutely. About 15 years ago, that Brian asked for a donation. And we had him talk to the club, and they donated an amount and it's grown over the years, but it sure has. it's like an investment in Apple 15 years ago. <laughs> uh, you have grown this thing to a point where it's something we could be proud of, too. Well, we're all doing this together. Yep. And hopefully someday, these people will be living in some version of Stone, Massachusetts that works for them. That's what I'd <laughs> yeah. like to see. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other questions? So those of you that still can't figure out what to buy for your relatives, it's right there. <laughs>
Except you can't have the tree because Dick's already got that. I know, <laughs> I know. I'll get you one next year. Can I have a motion for adjourning? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much.